Exploring history, the Hawes murder, a dark Birmingham history. It was one of Birmingham's most heinous murders at the time. It was the ultimate betrayal. Innocent lives were taken, hearts were broken, and the city was in turmoil. This 1888 triple homicide furnished early Birmingham its most sensational crime, spurring national headlines and a bloody and deadly riot. The year was 1888. Downtown Birmingham, Alabama was the scene of a bloody and deadly riot. 11 people were killed, more were injured. The magic city, as Birmingham had come to be known, had already struggled from its founding in 1871 with brawls, beatings and shootings, small riots and civil disorder in general. A gruesome triple murder put the young city on the map and gained national media attention a case riddled with intrigue, scandal, and betrayal. Who were these victims? Who were the key players in the homicide? Are the ghost stories and sightings genuine? Now, 130 plus years after the discovery of the first body, we will talk with a local historian on Birmingham's dark past to get new documented insight into this tragic event, the Haas Horror. Together, we will connect the known evidence to find answers as to what happened in that fateful day in December 1888. We will discover locations that no longer exist, apart from East Lake Park, where our story begins. Join William Nolan as he seeks to unearth this all but forgotten tragic tale and brings awareness to an issue that continues to plague the entire world to this day, domestic violence. Follow along as we go exploring history. In December of 1888, there were a couple of young boys out on East Lake, and they saw what they thought was a doll floating on the top of the water. So they rode over there and saw that it was a child. So rather than do anything with it, they rode back to shore and got help. They brought some, um, some police officers. They came and got the child, drug her back, and they saw that it was, in fact, a young girl. And when they drug her up and put her on the side of the banks, there was a crowd that gathered pretty quickly, and everybody was uh, just ooing and aahing and crying, and it was pitiful. Goldsmith B. West described her in his 1889 book, The Haas Horror, as she had large blue eyes, light wavy brown hair, was dressed in a neat brown or blue worsted skirt underneath which was a warm plaid underskirt. She wore button shoes and black corded stockings. She was three feet, 11 and one half inches in height and appeared to be about 12 years of age. East Lake actually during that time was a, was a destination place. It was a man-made lake that was created outside of the city proper so that the people that lived here had a place to go on the weekends and it had an amusement park, it had a zoo, you could go fishing, you could go swimming. It was just the place to go. They had a trolley that went straight to East Lake from downtown Birmingham. Initially, no one was able to identify the child. In the hope of finding someone who recognized her, officials put her body on display for the public at Lockwood and Miller's funeral parlor. They had had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people go by to look at her body to try to identify her, and nobody knew who she was. There was children that saw her. There were women and men all across the communities, and nobody knew who she was. It was the following day about 2 o'clock in the afternoon when young W.O. Franklin, a local butcher, dropped in and recognized the child as May Hawes, the daughter of Richard Hawes, a locomotive engineer on the Georgia Pacific Railroad Company. The exact location of the funeral parlor is unknown. However, on information found in Goldsmith B. West's book, The Hawes Horror, William was able to determine it was located on the same city block where the McWayne Science Center now stands. The coroner uh, apparently gathered a bunch of people to, to sit on a jury. It's a little different apparently then compared to now. The coroner got a group of people together and then they started an inquest. They started trying to figure out what was going on. The investigation led to the Haas home on Chestnut Hill near the present site of the Highland Park Golf Course. Police found the home deserted and evidence is that a horrible crime had been committed. 
when they walked in, there was no, there was no furniture left. There was just a bunch of random just stuff. Uh, but they did find spots of blood all over the house. And they found what they called a club had some blood stains on it as well. A horrible suspicion grew. A bloody axe and a trail of blood leading in the direction of the Lakeview Lake was also found. Those who knew the Hawes family believed that the mother, too, had been murdered and the body concealed. Is that what happened to the family? Did Richard kill his own wife and children? Couldn't find Richard. They couldn't find Emma. They couldn't find Irene. They couldn't find anybody else in the family. Uh, but somebody saw an article that came out in the paper that said Richard Hawes had just gotten married to a young lady in Columbus, Mississippi. Well, in that article, it said that he was going to be going from Columbus, Mississippi to Atlanta for part of their honeymoon trip. From Mississippi to Atlanta, they would have to go through Birmingham. So they didn't even have to go and track him down. They were just waiting on him when he got to the train station. When the train made a stop at the Birmingham train station at 9.40 p.m., police officers boarded and arrested Richard Haas for murder, and he was placed in the Jefferson County Jail. According to several newspapers from that time, when Richard was arrested, he was described to be indifferent to his surroundings. He did not even ask which of his children he was accused of murdering. The Huntsville Gazette reported at the time that his new wife, May's story, was heartbroken and that Richard sent her a note from jail, which she never replied. He met her in Columbus, I guess, when he was in his travels as an engineer, and they married there. And after he was arrested on the train, she, I think she spent one night in Birmingham, but then she turned around and went back home. And she ended up, um, I went into isolation for a while. I think she may have been institutionalized for a short period of time. And she waited about three years before she married again. She did tell police and reporters that Richard represented himself to be a widower with only one child, a boy who had relatives in Atlanta, and took immediate steps to have her marriage with Richard annulled that likely was never legitimate, and later petitioned the Mississippi legislature for permission to reclaim her maiden name. Concern grew with police and the public at the time of the whereabouts of Emma Hawes and the other daughter, Irene Hawes. The homicide began making headlines as the news traveled quickly beyond Birmingham. The Huntsville Gazette called it the East Lake Horror. On Friday, December 7, 1888, the chief of police in Atlanta received a telegram from the chief of police in Birmingham asking if any of the children of Richard Hawes were in Atlanta. A reporter went with the police to the residence of Richard's brother, James Hawes, at 140 Walton Street. Willie Haas, the son of Richard Haas, who was five years old at the time, was reported to be well and alive and that he had been at the residence for several months. But where was Emma and Irene Haas? The mystery only deepened. Newspapers reported that authorities began following up on the evidence found at the Haas residence, which included blood droplets and drag marks that suggested the bodies of Emma and her young daughter Irene were most likely in the Lakeview Lake, which is now on the site of the Highland Park Golf Course. The local authorities were convinced that that's where Emma had ended up, and possibly Irene. They had found what they called a blood trail and a drag trail that went through a fencing around the property, and they were just convinced that that's where she was, and they spent days dragging and dragging, and finally literally snagged on something heavy and they drug, drug it up, and sure enough, it was Emma. The back of Emma's head had apparently been split open by a blow with an axe or club. I'm convinced Richard had to have had help because she was tied to these big metal railroad ties, and he could not have lifted her and these by himself. Who helped Richard commit this brutal murder? Fanny Bryant worked for the Halls family off and on, and I'm not really sure we ever knew what her role was in the murder. Exactly. She had a story, and every time she told her story, it was different. She never admitted to having anything to do with it, but she did end up being convicted as an accessory. She served 12 years in prison. She died in a prison riot before she was actually pardoned by the governor in 1901. Albert Patterson was actually a, a nephew by marriage to Fanny Bryant. 
we really don't know exactly what his roles were. And he, he lived with Fanny, and he did some work for the Halls family, off and on as well. And he ended up being convicted as an accessory as well. But since he was helpful, and since he agreed to testify, he did get a shorter sentence. I don't know what happened to him after he got out of prison, um, but I do know he was convicted, but got a shorter sentence than Fanny did. Hey, while I have you, if you like this content, check out my channel, William Nolan. If you want to see bloopers, behind the scenes, any fun that we had making this video for you, go check out my playlist, Behind Exploring History, and any other content that's available. If you know of any local history, a legend, or a mysterious artifact or site I need to explore right here in Alabama or anywhere else I want to know about it, please leave me a comment below, like this video, and subscribe. And don't forget to hit the notification bell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Richard was still incarcerated at the Jefferson County Jail. With the aid of old Birmingham maps, William was able to determine the jail was located on the corner of 21st Street North and 4th Avenue North, where the YMCA now stands. That same Saturday, unrest commenced with the people of Birmingham as the autopsy results were released, and it was discovered that young Mary Hawes had been killed by chloroform in drowning and that her mother, Emma's body, had been located. Birmingham was still an up-and-coming city, so when most of this was coming to light were was on a Friday and a Saturday and a Sunday. That's when most of the information was coming out. There were more than 40 saloons downtown in, in just like a 10 block radius at this time. So there was a lot of drinking going on. They all just started in different pockets around the city gathering together to march to the jail. So the more they drank, the more emboldened that they became. So they all started just chanting, you know, hang Richard, hang Richard. The sheriff was convinced that he did not need help from the military, but he was being advised by so many other people, uh, you need to call in all these military groups to come in, and, and because they knew that all this murmuring was going on, that there was going to be trouble. Uh, so they didn't call in any help until it was too late. When they got down there, um, there were a lot of people around sheriff's deputies and some other local police officers were trying to talk them down. You know, trying to talk them into, you know, just leave, go home, let the law take control of this. Uh, but they just, w they wouldn't have it. And they were just crazed. The sheriff kept telling the, the populace, the rioters, that don't, don't come any closer, don't come any closer. And the rioters didn't really believe that they would sh fire on them. There's no way that they would shoot them. They just were convinced that that was not going to happen. That's not what came to pass. They kept pushing and kept pushing and got too close and somebody from the roof of the building fired the first shot. <laughs> Eleven people were killed, uh, with, and they, several of them died immediately, several of them died within just hours, and there were 12 that were injured, some of them supposedly mortal. The downtown riot received national coverage, including front page headlines for several days in the New York Times, drawing undesirable attention to Birmingham. During that time, the city was already dealing with a reputation as a violent and tough place. To make matters worse, Sheriff Smith and City Police Chief O.A. Pickard were arrested for their involvement in the bloody riot within 24 hours of the shootings. However, none were ever convicted. To this day, no lynch mob has stormed the county jail since that tragic day. Several days passed, and authorities still had not located the remains of little Irene. After repeatedly dragging the lake at Lakeview, officials decided to drain it. Three days after this slow process began, on Tuesday, December 11, 1888, Irene's weighted down body was discovered approximately 30 feet from where her mother had been found. She was very, very small, and they said she was a beautiful, obviously a beautiful little girl, the middle child. Once they got her up and they realized that, okay, there was in fact three murders, then they started gathering the information for the trial. James Hawes, the brother of Richard, was in Birmingham and was able to identify Irene's body as Richard's second daughter. 
The body was taken to the funeral home and promptly buried two days later. The trial of Richard began Monday, April 22, 1889. The proceedings only lasted 11 days. Richard had among his attorneys some of the most capable in Birmingham, including Chief Defense Counsel E.T. Taliaferro. The state was also represented by County Solicitor James E. Hawkins. A motion by the defense for a new trial was quickly overruled, as was a motion to overturn the indictment. Richard stood trial only for the murder of his daughter May, which, according to the newspaper reports, had the strongest evidence introduced against him. The prosecution called several witnesses, including the conductor of the East Lake dummy line, the trolley running from downtown to East Lake. The trolley driver said that he remembered Richard coming with May to Eastlake on the regular trolley, but it was late in the evening. He went out with her, and they stayed for a while, and then Richard came back, but May didn't. Richard argued that the trolley driver had his days confused. After Richard ended up not getting anywhere with the Supreme Court, they decided to go ahead and hang him. Interestingly enough, one of the men on the jury for him in Birmingham was the one who built the scaffold for him. So he actually watched out the window as one of his jurors built the scaffold. Finally, February 27, 1890, he walked up to the scaffold with his wedding suit on that he had married his second wife in with a geranium in his lapel. Supposed to be private with 50 tickets, but hundreds were there outside the walls. Some climbed up on the wall and sat there to watch because they all wanted to be witness to this particular event. And when he got up on the scaffold, he t told the crowd his last words were, he blamed women and alcohol for his downfall. And he was hung. Richard had asked his brother James, Jim, to take care of his body when it was over. So Jim was there. And when the hanging was done and they took his body down, he put it in a nailed coffin, wooden coffin, put it on a train and took it back to Atlanta where he was buried in an unmarked grave. What happened to Richard and Emma's son, Willie? He was now the only surviving family member with his mother, father and sisters now deceased. Richard and Emma had a son by the name of Willie. He was the youngest. He was five or six at the time, very, very small. He was living with Richard's brother, Jim, in Atlanta. And the biggest mystery to me is what happened to Willie. I have never been able to find Willie anywhere. Uh, I have not found a William Hawes, a Willie Hawes. I have found no mention of him at all. So I assume that they must have changed his name at some point uh, because of the connection to Richard. As for Emma, Irene and May Hawes, they are buried together in an unmarked grave in Birmingham's Oak Hill Cemetery. The question remains, where was Emma's side of the family? Why did none of them give her and the girls a proper burial site? There was no family left. Her father died, her mother had died, her sister had died, all before they left Atlanta. But there was no close family members for her left which probably was part of the reason Richard knew he could get away with it. There's nobody to mourn them, except for the city of Birmingham. What happened to the money that was raised by the city of Birmingham to put, to bury the girls and Emma and put up a marker? They collected enough money to bury them. They bought the plot, they bought the caskets, they buried them, but they never put up a marker and I, I would like to know why, but I've never been able to find out why. My main takeaway for the whole situation, I think, is I want people to understand that domestic violence exists, that if you are in a situation that you're not happy with, there's ways to get out of it. You don't have to hurt people. You don't have to kill people to get out of it. You can do it without harming others. And I want Emma's story told. I want to scream from the rooftops. This was a woman who existed. She wasn't perfect. Everybody knew that she drank too much. Was it because of the, her life that she had with Richard? Who knows? But she didn't deserve what she got. 
her sweet daughters, they certainly didn't deserve it. And I want to scream it from the rooftops. They are poster children, for the lack of a better word, for domestic violence. And I really want people to understand that. And to, even though it was 130 years ago, it still matters. And I still want their story told. As this quest comes to a close, I have many questions to reflect on. These murders have sparked speculation, controversy, and public outrage. This was a case of heartbreaking betrayal and senseless killing. So much has changed. However, the stories remain. The pond where Emma and Irene were found is gone. It is now the Highland Park Golf Course along historic Highland Avenue on Birmingham's south side. The lake where little May's body was found is now the centerpiece of East Lake Park, which features a walking trail that circles the peaceful lake. It has been said May still walks the banks of the lake. Two beautiful places, but with a gruesome history. In reflection, what haunts me most is the fact that Emma and her two precious little girls were buried in a pauper's grave with no headstone or plot marker. I encourage you to watch this video until the end and click the link for a special message. I'll see you on the next episode of Exploring History.